water will come back. Okay. And I've got two of my besties in the audience. Where are they? <laughs> That's awesome. Shout out to the besties. Shout out to the besties. Yeah. There's only two of them, but two is enough. <laughs> But interesting enough, we might attempt to Where keep it in these? from yeah. that to a I guess I can officially say good afternoon, everyone at StoryFest at Westport Library. Um, I'm Brian Ripley Crandall. I direct the Connecticut Writing Project at Fairfield University, and I'm associate professor who works with K-12 teachers and children. Um, I was thinking the first step I wanted to do before we go through the panel is just to kind of make ourselves comfortable with the topic and theme of this panel, which is home and identity and relocation and change. And I thought it would be really cool if everybody just turns and talks. We make it noisy in here for a second. Mm -hmm. Introduce yourself to your neighbor. Where are you from? But more importantly, how did that location influence who you are individually, right? So turn and talk to somebody. Introduce where you're from. And how do you think that location changed who you are individually? <laughs> This is not a graded assignment, it's just two minutes. <laughs> That's good. I always like want to pull everybody up. Come on up front, we're gonna dance. All right. more conversations. 30 seconds. <laughs> now they're going to be so busy chatting to each other. Right, exactly. Not going to want to let them talk. Yeah. Class, yeah. <laughs> All right, and trail off. All right, we're going to turn it up to the panelists up here. Welcome, welcome, welcome once again. Um, in my own, I guess, reformation as Brian Ripley Crandall from Syracuse <laughs> to Louisville, back to Syracuse to Connecticut, with some stomps over in London and Denmark. So that's kind of fun too. All right, panelists, why not introduce yourself? We'll start out there. Your definition of home and the influences your original home has on you today. Not a lot, big question, but just a briefing, and then I'm gonna go in a little bit further. So we're gonna start to my right with Mitzi, the golden poet who was on our panel today. Right, so home for me right now is here, now being able to be still in the present moment, be aware of my body, my surroundings, other people. Um, home where I came from, Jamaica, West Indies, um, that influenced me to be where I am now because um, there were some points in my life when I wasn't able to be still and, you know, just too many thoughts of what people think and things like that or lessons learned in society of judging myself and others. It was hard to just be present and, and be here now. And so I had to unlearn all that stuff. And what, um, what helped me was remembering myself rolling down hills in Jamaica, catching butterflies, walking barefoot in the stream, laying on my back, looking up at the sky, making shapes out of the clouds and, um, and just to be still. And so that's what home is for me now. And um, yeah. Amrata. Yeah, um, so home is an existential question for me because I don't know, that's <laughs> the true answer. I spent my whole life figuring out what home is and young, you know, when I was younger, it was people just instantly knew this is where I'm from. I came to this country when I was eight years old. We moved around a lot. I went to a different high school, uh, a different school every year until my senior year of high school. And then I went to college, then I moved again and I've been sort of, nomadic, so the closest I feel a sense of place is Boston because I've lived there continuously. I developed my adult friendships there and relationships there, but I'm still in search of like, I don't know if it's a sense of like something you just know, like where you walk in and you're like, I feel at home and this is where I want to stay forever. So it's still an ongoing question, uh, answer for me. Right, and I like the fluidity of that response because home changes over time. Yeah. Oliver. 
Hi, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead just by saying that I'm transgender because otherwise nothing that I say is going to make any sense <laughs> to anybody. Um, so um, home is very definitely in my transition body, um, but it was originally England, as you can probably tell from the accent, um, and I left there 15 years ago and th there, was, there was no way for me to find this home in my transition body without leaving my homeland first. Um, so it's not really geographical for me. I mean, I think that um, I, I'm unlikely to leave America because I found myself here, I transitioned here, my community, the, the community that I have here is like really remarkable. Um, so I feel like this is my home if I had to choose a geographical location, um, but really home, home is my body very much so at this point. I like that, thank you. Hi, my name is Sonia. Um, so I grew up in a small town in the Rust Belt in Illinois, um, not a literary place, but it is, I still think of it as home, sort of. But it's an ambivalent place because it's not a place with a, really a lot of culture or readers. So I left uh, to, to find that. And so yeah, home is, it always sort of has this homesick notion to it because I'm I'm there but I can never stay so thank you cool um, my name is Sadiq and home for me is it's a combination of it's abstract and also like the physical place um, DNA wise my parents were both born in in Sierra, Le Sierra Leone West Africa so I am Sierra Leonean in my DNA. Um, I was born in, in Houston, Texas. I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, all the way until I was 18, and then I, I left uh, for school in New York City, and I've been living in New York City ever since. And so um, all of those places feel like home. The, most ironically, the place that at least feel like home was the, the place that I was born, Houston, Texas, because I was only there 12 months, and then I moved, so. Uh, yeah, all of those places are home for me. Right, and, and one of the things that I found in common amongst all of your bodies of work are these stories of transition, these stories of relocation, these stories of change, of what our definition of home is. And um, I was thinking, I, I was recently working with uh, actor uh, Gare Duaney, he's a, uh, also a model and an activist, a UNHCR activist, and he was relocated from um, Sudan, southern Sudan. Um, because of the war there. And as he relocated to Des Moines, Iowa, um, he started having lots of identity restructuring and crises, right? Um, but now he's a novelist as well, and they're turning that um, book into a movie. And it made me think a little bit, Namrata, about your writing of the diaspora, and what does that mean for um, an individual like you in America trying to figure out these cross-boundaried identities. Um, and so if you could talk about that a little bit through the lens of Candid Life of Mina Dave and offer some insight about from the scent of garden, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, Big question. <laughs> I was going to say, I could do a two and a half hour lecture on this or just read my books. But uh, um, when, when you're straddling two cultures and two cultures that are diametrically opposite, it's, at least when I was growing up, East and West were less fluid than they are now, right? So you, you had to code switch all the time and in the West you're sort of trying to embody what America is. Like, I hate turkey, but like at Thanksgiving you feel the need to eat turkey, <laughs> right? Um, but in my house, it was a very Eastern household, right? So we ate Gujarati every day of the week, cooked, clean. I took on the traditional role of an Indian, Gujarati Indian woman, right? I was trained to be a dutiful housewife. Uh, no one got the benefit of that. Um, I take care of myself very well. <laughs> but you have these juxtapositions that you struggle with, and that's what I wanted to write about. And diaspora, like one of the definitions is that the the generation that came before you brings that culture into the new world, but from their lens of that. So like India has evolved well past my parents' not notion of India, right? So there was a conservative, conservativeness. So even in diaspora, like you don't feel firmly rooted in anything, 
because your culture is dynamic, your identity is dynamic, and I wanted to explore what that means for the choices you make, right? So um, you can choose to just stay put in one frame and go with the, the traditions and the norms of that culture. You can choose to completely disassociate from that and say, you know, my college fake ID was a blonde photo of, and a woman named Heather. <laughs> like, it just happened. So like, there, you can choose that or you can find a way um, and that comes with age and lived experience. Um, you know, my heroines try to find a way to be like, what does it mean for me and my identity that is, n that is like an amalgamation of the things I've pulled from the different places. Mm -hmm. So that's, I, I, I don't know if that like got to the root of your question, but it, mm -hmm. to me, I just wanted to talk about, all, my books explore that uh, tension of choices that you constantly have and you don't necessarily have the traditional idea of what family is or home is. Or and one of the things that I said, think mm -hmm. you said that is resonated with me is that one's family's identity to place changes over time too because place doesn't sit still. And so their definition of a culture may not be the culture that's being defined there today. Fascinating. Um, when I was doing work research with um, several African-born male refugees in and out of school in upstate New York, I came across a British scholar named Stephen Vertovec. And Stephen Vertovec said, the world and the globe needs to embrace for super diversity because super diversity is the future of all cultures. As, as a result of colonialism and imperialism, we are now blending our spaces. And I think the beauty of this particular panel is demonstrated here today. But I also love the idea that there's super diversity within the local, which I think Sandy Huber accomplishes in Love and Industry, a Midwestern cookbook. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how did you come to these essays and what, do you, what were you trying to accomplish and, and was there a tension within your own Southern Connecticut identity as you were thinking about being a Midwest girl? <laughs> there was, well, first I should say, so there's a, there doesn't really, I don't know if I'm Connecticut, and that's okay. I mean, I like my home here, but it's when people say to you constantly, oh, you sound like you're from the south of Chicago, like then that, you know, I can't get it out of my voice, like that nasal, like, huh? So, you know, that's one marker. Uh, and so I wrote the essays in the essay collection over 20 years. But weirdly enough, I never thought that I would write a book of Midwestern essays. Um, I'm sort of the, the sales pitch for the Midwest on the East Coast. Every time I meet a Midwesterner, I'm like, yeah. I don't know why, other than that we're very nice people. Um, uh, but so I didn't see that I really had anything as a whole to say about the Midwest, because it's sort of invisible, as your own background often is. Um, and I mean, I think I have tried to find little pockets that feel like the Midwest to me. Um, Bridgeport, Connecticut is one of those places. Um, I recently, or oh, not recently, geez, over the past 10 years, I've been doing this weird project of walking the boundary between Bridgeport and Fairfield and just writing about it. And in all those walks, like folks that I would run into in Bridgeport would always just be, you know, the friendliest, nicest people, the people that just say hi as you're walking down the street. That's what I remember from the Midwest. I'm also that person in other parts of Connecticut that's like aggressively like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> to strangers. So I, I, yeah, so there's, and there's also a lot about the Rust Belt visually that also is evoked by Bridgeport. So. I guess, uh, and the last essay, uh, yeah, you're totally right, Brian, and I was totally wrong, because the last essay in the collection is about sort of seeing my home uh, and sort of, you know, the, the, the remains of industry near where I live in Bridgeport and really just thinking that that's beautiful because it holds kind of the history of working people and the visual remains of that era. So yeah, I guess uh, yeah. I'm. I guess I am 
representing the Midwest here in Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, in this, in terms of super diversity too, I mean, it is we have regionality of the United States, and we have storing of our our own locations, and then we have like all the multicultural mm -hmm. pastiche of, of what's represented on on the page today. But what I think is also fascinating is how just one space or one tenant or one occupation can have multiple stories. So I, I'm curious, Sadiq, because you wrote about a single place in Harlem, mm -hmm. right? What were the how what where, what was the origin of that? Like one location, several stories, and what's what's the history of that? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I would say the history of that it started with um, a fascination with with voice, dialect, and and slang, um, the re regionalism of American language, how people talk in conversation. Um, the shorthand, the verb, the personality that's depicted in the everyday conversation. And I find myself um, really, really inspired by works like, um, you know, Color Purple, um, Alice Walker, um, Push by Sapphire, which everybody knows is precious now because of the movie. <laughs> um, and, you know, authors like Tony K. Bambara, Juno Diaz, Sherman Alexi, and people always like to think like, oh, if we're talking slang or voice, it's, it's authors of, of color, but it, the American, like, voice canon, mm. it goes back to, like, independence. Like, you know, it's, uh, it's Ring Lardner, it's, it's mm -hmm. even Walt Whitman at times. Um, and so there's that rich tradition of um, Americans on the page saying, this is how we talk and this, is, this defines um, our space mm -hmm. and this is our style that we have infused in, in this language. And I've been always, uh, that was the first thing that like inspired me. And then it was like, all right, um, how can we make this uh, publishable? <laughs> and, and these days, right now, it's like, I think the trend is, especially with short stories, it's like linked collections. Yeah, yeah. It's like things that are taking place in the same place. I was talking to another agent um, at, at a function, and she was like, I represent a short story writer, um, but when she's on the plane, she loves novels. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to get something. She wants to read something that she can get lost into. So, like, even as a short story writer, I'm I'm guilty of that. Like, long form. What are the overlying themes? So, I said, what started as like separate stories focused on voice turned into like, how can we make this more unified? And for me, there was no better symbol than the like the American apartment building. Right. You know. So that yeah, that's the jumping off point. Right, uh, that was that was wonderful, mm -hmm. and I was actually thinking about how much I appreciate the short story genre. Mm -hmm. As a K twelve educator, we need more short story writers. <laughs> yeah. So I want to talk to you after this little panel because I have some ideas. No, um, so I'm going to move back to Oliver, and I'm going to stray from the question I originally had um, because you came right out and said home is in within. And before we came up on, on the panel today, I, I was telling Oliver that I started thinking about the metaphor of the monarch butterfly, right? The metamorphosis of being an egg in South America, being a caterpillar, then flying to Texas, then laying eggs, and being a caterpillar, then flying to New York, laying eggs, and being a caterpillar, then going up to Canada. And then that three generations later, the monarch knows to fly back down to South mm -hmm. America. How, right? And I started thinking about how at each change in our life, mm -hmm we redefine home and what home means to us, which I'm excited about with the work that you're doing because that seems to be the exploration that you've come to as you write about your identity transformations with location in mind as you have moved from space to space. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I can, and it's actually something that I've been thinking about quite a lot recently <clears throat> since after this book has come out. Um, because I've, I've I've written two books, one one which has just been published, and one just being published next summer. And um, the first one is is really about trans as a bodily experience, and the second one is a memoir. Um, and and since finishing those, it, it's given me a chance to move away and have a greater perspective about where I come from and how I exist now, and how that has so dramatically changed who I am, not just. 
um, not just because of the, the transition itself. So the people that I come from are the bad guys, right? I, I come from up, an upper-class English family, and, and my ancestors were the colonialists and the, and, and, and the, peop and, 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 and the people who occupied other people's countries. And, and that, um, that vision, their vision of the world has very much moved down through the generations and still exists in the people that I, that I was brought up with and, and the people who were my family and my extended village when I was growing up. And that, um, I could only see myself through their eyes when I was living in England. I couldn't see myself because the problem with being trans before you understand that you're trans or before you've transitioned is, you, you know, you are completely deceived by your own body and by how everybody else perceives you because, you know, the, the doctor says you're a woman and your parents say you're a woman and your friends say you're a woman and there's nobody who says you're not a woman apart from this little voice in your own head which you tend not to listen to because it's kind of on its own. Um, so... It was only when I came to this country that I could start the process of trying to re-see myself. Mm. And I could do that specifically in this country because I didn't belong here. Mm. And I think that this movement, this, 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 this geographical movement from England to America isn't necessarily that America is a more hospitable environment for somebody like me, because obviously we know that in, in some cases it's not. Um, it's more that... I have, there's no preconception of who I am here. So the only thing that people understand about me when I'm in this country is maybe that I'm British because of my accent. But beyond that, I had the opportunity to completely reinvent myself. So, you know, using that um, chrysalis butterfly metaphor, this was where my chrysalis started to happen and, and where I emerged, you know, as, as the man you see before you today. Um, and... For a long time, particularly after I finished writing the memoir, there was a question of how, what is it like for me to go back to my home country now? When I go back there, will I discover that actually this idea I have in my mind that I cannot be myself in that country mm -hmm. is really just in my mind and, and in, in, in practical terms, if I go back, I'll discover that it's much more accepting than I thought it was, that, you know, the fear is, that the, the fear of fear is greater than the fear itself. Um, and I think that is true of the generations coming in below me. So my nieces and nephews and their friends and that new generation of queer people and queer allies get it, but my parents' generation, yeah. No, it's, it, they're just still, they cannot. My parents have been so supportive and they've tried so hard to talk to their friends. And I actually gave my mother permission, you know, five years after I started transition, I said to my mother, okay, you just need to stop trying now. Um, because it's breaking her heart and, and it's breaking my heart, seeing her heart being broken. Um, but they, ca they, they cannot see outside of this perspective that they have because this perspective is generations old. Right. Um, but I don't feel, um, I don't feel adrift, I don't feel homeless, I don't feel disembodied because I have the experience now that I never had before which is when something distresses me or upsets me, I can come home into my own body and find peace there. And before I transitioned, I never had that. So before I transitioned, when things upset me, which they did all the time because I was a closeted trans person, um, I had nowhere to go with that. So there was no place to find comfort. Whereas now that I've transitioned, I've discovered if something upsets me, all I gotta do is sit down and breathe for a little bit and I can find comfort in this body. And that's, um, that's really a remarkable gift. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, last night, I had the pleasure of eating with Mitzi, my new friend next to me, who's also a poet. And we talked a lot about labels, right? We talked a lot about yes. the way the world puts things on us because of our skin, because of our hair, because of our eye color, because of our zip code, if you were here in the last panel talking about Greenwich. And those labels sometimes are detrimental. And you've come in your collection um, um, that's up there on the, on the screen, you write a lot about twisting those labels beyond and putting it behind you and, and giving yourself therapy through the words that you write. Can you talk a little bit about your story and a little bit about what we talked about last night and beyond? 
Uh, yes. Um, you know, just my story is, I, I, I call it, you know, when I'm sharing my story, I said, I call it beyond the story, letting go of internalized oppression. You know, I was talking to you about labels and stuff because at my darkest moments of wanting a better life and not having access, um, you know, the oppression that I internalized for myself and telling someone my story told me that I'm depressed and, you know, and, and used mental illness mm -hmm. um, toward, towards me. And so, you know, realizing that and just I had no clue or no idea about what they're talking about, but I was so desperate to live a better life, meaning for me to have a nice home with a white picket fence and the Mercedes Benz. And, and this is just something that I came to America and watched on television. Mm -hmm. And, and saw that this is, and it, I, I was learning that. I was unconsciously learning that. I was, I was also consciously learning it from people that you need to have a home. I remember a 11th grade teacher told me, um, you know, make some money and get out of Bridgeport, <laughs> you know? And, you know, so these, these ideas just kept um, in, you know, that this is what I should do. So I then had my children you know, come and to a private school, Green Swarms Academy in, in Westport, and they're going to a really great school. And then I start seeing a lot of wealth, you know, money, nice, nice cars, nice homes. And I really wanted it, you know, for my kids. I wanted the white picket fence. And, um, and that's, you know, a nice place that my kids' friends could come over for um, play dates and stuff like that. And, and, um, but I didn't have that, and, and so I went to ask for help because I didn't want to be crying all the time or be sad or having desires for, for this thing um, that I had came to learn that this is the way you should, this is what you should have, this is the American dream. And, you know, I had no idea of redlining and, mm -hmm. and Jim Crow laws and, and all those kind of things. I, I, didn't, I didn't know about those things. So therefore, this is why I call it letting go of internalized oppression because it's an oppressive system. Mm -hmm. Even right now, the, worth, the World Health Organization and the um, United Nations has asked for change in, um, in, 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 in psychiatric labeling and, and mental health services. They say it's an oppressive system mm -hmm. because people have been abused and, and traumatized and so they reach out and ask for help and someone gives them a label and drugs and say this is it for the rest of your life and it's so unfair it's oppressive and and it needs to be changed um, because people could change and um and 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 like i said for me just remembering who I am. Remember, I came from Jamaica. And I'm this little girl that was rolling down hills and catching butterflies. I went from um, changing my name to all different kinds of names, Kareen Ann Taylor, because I love Ann Taylor. I love the way they, <laughs> the, the suits dress and the way people dress nicely. And, 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 and that's what I'm supposed to be and look like from wearing bows in the back of my hair, just, just observing. And so that's kind of what the title of my book is, Top of the Zinc Roof, Poems Observed from Behind the Veil with a Glimpse of the Light, because uh, I believe that we're souls having this human experience. And I also believe like the, the spirit is, is, some, is, is also there, and it could be broken. And I, and I feel, and I see it, and I know, and I could even pinpoint the exact moment that my spirit just completely broke and left my body. My mother was just like completely beating me at another time with an electric cord. She's beating me with the electric cord and um, just the same kind of wire kind of stuff. And I decided that I wasn't going to let her see me cry anymore. And so as she was beating me, I, I stopped and started watching her. And so it's like I'm watching the whole scene from outside of my body and I'm watching her beating me and I'm observing it and I'm saying, oh my God, she just wants to see me cry. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what, she's just gonna, she's never gonna stop hitting you. So. Just give her a little bit. And so I said, oh, please, mommy. And she stopped. <laughs> and I said, see, and I, and I saw the power, and I had that power within myself. But I think it took me 
a very long time to be able to return back and, and just completely embrace mind, body, and spirit because just different life experience happened. My sister died that I didn't understand death, the shame that that caused. And so for me, the veil um, is, is like shame. It's, it's like shame of all the abuse, the sexual, physical, emotional abuse, the abandonment, the poor education and all those things. Um, cause such shame that when I need to be here and sit and talk with someone and look them in the eye, it, shame kept me from doing that. And so what has got me to be able to be present and be home in my body and in my mind and my spirit and get my spirit to rise to beat my soul is forgiveness. And I, and I tell people that all the time. I'm saying, I'm not promoting Jesus to you, but I'm telling you that man dying on a cross and people, while he's dying, people, he said, forgive them because they know not what they did, what they doing I think like if my mother knew that beating me was like that if my father knew abusing me like that you know if they knew what, the, what they were doing what that would cost the, my spirit being broken maybe they they wouldn't have done it so let me just forgive them and that just set me free from that I all of the stories all of the stories that I sat and I told a therapist over and over again and hold on to all the emotional pain of it I was able to um also started to remember the joy, even holding my dad's hand as a little kid and remember the confidence that I had in my being of holding my dad's hand as a little six, seven-year-old girl. And that confidence and all of that is within myself. And so that's how I, I return, return home and just to be, and, and to be able to understand that home is to be here now and, and, um, and, and connection. And I love what Ram Das says, like we're all walking each other home. And, right. mm. and so, yeah, so that's kind of where I am. And, and I'm telling you, the, the whole thing of looking for a home, I lived in, I, at one point, I think I lived in, I, I might have lived in 20 different places or, or, or apartments and, and, all this, and all those different things and, and just looking for it to be fixed up nice this time and um, spending a lot of money and fixing it up, bed, bath, and beyond, got a lot of money from me. <laughs> and, you, you know, and, um, and, 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 you thought, and, you know, God is so, is such a great God that he, this is what he showed me. I, I'm able to live right now to say I never got a, a, a big fancy house, but I'm able to live in a, a, a really great apartment with pool top, rooftop pools and all those different things. And, and, and it's saying that this is not it. You know, it gives you everything you want and then you have to say, this is not it. This is really not what it is. It's just, it's just to be here now. It's, uh, how do I treat the person that's right next to me? You know, um, how do I um, treat other people? You know, the empathy and compassion to be able to receive that empathy and compassion. And if I'm able to receive it, I'm able to give it back because you can't give what you don't have. And, and so with all of the abuse that I had, it took me a long time to be able to accept and, and receive empathy and compassion and kindness, you know, because I'm always waiting for the other foot to drop or somebody's going to hurt me and things like that, but be able to let that go and forget all of that stuff and just um, not hold on to the past, but to be present and then receive what somebody's given to you, you're able to give back all that empathy and compassion. Yeah, it's interesting that you, you made me think about how we work so hard to build a home or an identity for ourselves, mm -hmm. and it, everyone else comes at us to tear that down whether that is in physical war, like we see in the Middle East right now or in the Ukraine, or whether it's even in like our school systems. Um, I'm a huge fan of a scholar named Muhammad, or Goldie Muhammad, and um, she and Yolanda Sealy Ruse do all this really great work about how do we cultivate geniuses in each and every one of our kids, or how do we unearth joy um, in the young people that we work with, and they draw on this concept of an archaeological dig, mm -hmm. and that means you have to undo, redo, rethink your histories, but also your cultures, and you have to really look internally to the self. And I, I have a quote from the book about identity that I want to read to you. Um, she writes, identity is composed of notions of who we are, who others say we are, in both positive and negative ways, and whom we desire to be. There's a complex and dynamic dance among the three toward identity development throughout our lives. And I can't help but think that that is true. Who we see ourselves as, who others see us as, and who we want to be are constantly in battle. Mm -hmm. And that actually brings me back to Sonia, and then I'm going to open up to the whole panel. Um, in your book, Voice First, you offer individuals lots of exercises, <laughs> hundreds of exercises of finding voice. And you challenge this idea of the writer voice by making the argument that there are multiple voices in us 
all the time, 24 seven, and that often compete. Can you tell us a little bit about Voice First and then I'm gonna ask the panel about voices, so. Sure, um, so Voice First came about when uh, I got sick with rheumatoid arthritis and I started writing through pain and the writing I thought was not very good. Uh, it felt like it was coming through a little tiny pinpoint as opposed to on full blast. But the short version is that I shared some of that writing that I thought wasn't good and people were like, oh, this is it. This is the good stuff. And so I was sort of thinking, what was I doing before? <laughs> but um, that kind of, I named that voice pain woman and then started thinking about, well, what other crayons do I have in the box? What else can I work with? And so that and reading about um, multivocality and what it means to excavate all the different voices that we have from our past and sort of the present people we are in different situations, um, I just started you know, having these, experience, these experiments with other writers trying these out. Um, asking people if they could write in the voice of their intestines or their spleen, and weird things happen, and I like weird things, so I just I kept going. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I, I use that a lot in my uh, institutes for teachers and with, with students to figure out what are the voices that you find in a single day, and any of us who drive on I-95, we have the <laughs> I-95 voice. <laughs> you know, being from upstate New York, I used to always be like, why are people from downstate, like why are their voices so rogue and so like, Rrr? and then I, I, I moved here and got stuck in traffic and now I feel like I understand it completely. But let me, let me put it to the, the panel, like what are the major voices that have influenced your writing today and that are maybe it, you battle with but that you also accept? You wanna start with this one, Mitzi? Wow, um, major voices <laughs> yeah, that influence. Yeah, the voices that you hear. Wow, well, I, um, I, I'll always have to go back to my grandma. Mm -hmm. um, she was so strong and, um, and so powerful. You know, the way she worked hard and, um, and she worked out on the field and, you know, cutting down like a banana stalk and putting it on her back and dropping it to the ground. And she took me out to the field and, and stuff like that and just watching her. And, and then she, I, looking back, I could see that she didn't know how to read because she recited the same, it's the same Bible verses that she sung or recited every night, even though she had the Bible open and under her pillow all the time. And, mm. and, and so that it, it, it influenced me um, that even when I got the opportunity to, to speak, I remember one time somebody said, oh my God, your poem just vibrated through the building when you were speaking it. And I was just like, I feel like this is my grandma just right there, that's how she, that's how she spoke, that's how she made me feel. And I just, being able to get back and, and understand and being able to be still, I, um, you know, I, I get to know that it's, it's, it's the little things, it's the little things that, that matter, just doing the little things. Wanting that big thing and, and not doing the little things every day, just washing the dishes, spreading the bed, cleaning, connecting with somebody, it's just, it's, it's, it's just a powerful thing because it keeps you present. It keeps you in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And so um, my granddaughter, it was a, she turned 19 yesterday, she asked me like, uh, Mumsy, would you change anything about your life, different parents or anything? I'm like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. I want the same life. I feel like my soul told, my soul designed this life for me <laughs> to come here and be here, for me to wake up and be here in this present moment because like this moment, everything is beautiful. Even when the horrible things are happening, it's, it's still, it's still beauty in, in the world I like at all that times. Voice. I'm going to have to steal that voice. <laughs> Crandall, <laughs> bring on the Mitzi voice of optimism. <laughs> now, Mara, what about you? Yeah, I have a, I have an interesting, so for me, voice is your relationship, right? So whether it's a reader or the writer, hmm. it's the relationship between you and whoever's consuming your work and how do you want to convey that? Um, I'm challenged by voice a lot because I grew up American lit. Right, in which I didn't exist in that, yeah. that network of stories. Um, and then um, my generation, so I did a lot of work in, in grad school around like what I've, you know, you've heard 1.5 generation or whatever. Um, my generation, we were like, we started with assimilation and now the generation after is like, take back our culture. And so we got completely lost, right? So. The voice that I try to more like show is these people that didn't exist. So they don't exist in literature. They don't exist in contemporary fiction. 
it's this straddling of duality that, um, you know, Gen X, uh, for lack of a better framing, deals with in terms of, you, like, you have a very specific uh, journey towards now. Like, we didn't have the internet, and now <laughs> we don't know how to live without the internet. <laughs> and the amount of change this generation process externally, as well as internally from going from a very oppressive society to a little bit more tolerant, or maybe have a long way to go, but you know what I mean? We, this panel wouldn't exist when I was in college, right. in a sense. Exactly. So the voice is really like, who am I representing? Because for me, representation matters because I just didn't have that. And I'm no Jampalahari, right? So like it is a different sort of voice, which was the immigrant experience wasn't the dual duality experience. So. Love that response. Oliver. Um, I, I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna say the person who taught me about voice was somebody that Sidek mentioned, which is um, Juno Diaz. Mm. Um, and when I first started writing my memoir, I I was too afraid to speak in my own voice and people, my early readers were saying, I can't hear you in mm -hmm. it. And I didn't understand what they were saying. I didn't understand what I was doing wrong. And then I started reading Diaz and I was like, oh, this is what it means to speak in your own voice. And, and I think it's not, it's not just about dialect. It's, a, it's about vulnerability. I'm interested to hear what you think about this in the book that you've written. I, I realized that, um, you, you know, when you're writing very, very personal stuff, you know, that transgender memoir is pretty personal, um, there is this huge fear of making yourself vulnerable. And, um, and, and there is, a, there is a, the sort of latent feeling as if, if I can sound really intelligent, oh, yeah. maybe people will forgive me for this extraordinary story that I'm about to put out into the public. And um, I, I realized that that it just wasn't working, and that the only way to write this book was in my own voice and to allow myself to sound ridiculous sometimes when I feel ridiculous or confused or messy and, and write in, you know, write in a way that my, you know, middle school English teacher would not have approved of, um, you know, write in ungrammatical sentences. Um, and the first draft that I wrote like that my readers were like, bingo, that's it. And, and that's what got me the agent and, and the eventual um, publishing contract. And so that's how I write now. And sometimes I'm like, you know, I want to be Marsha Guess and I want to like, really, <laughs> you know, I, I want to I be Judith Butler. I want to write something really intelligent so people are really impressed by me. Um, but that's not how I communicate. That's not who I am. The way I communicate is, is yeah. by chatting with people. And um, particularly around an issue that is so complex, as you know, gender nonconformity. If you try and 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 and, and uh, uh, if you try and cover that up with kind of intellectual theory and academia, people are just like, oh, I just, I, yeah, I'm going to go and get a cup of coffee, because um, it's a lot. It's complex, and so, you know, I have really kind of leaned into just talking how I talk, write how I talk, communicate how I talk, and, and really sticking with my guns there. So that's great. Yeah, that's great, Siddiqui. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that idea of vulnerability and just allowing yourself to be pure, purely yourself, um, however it comes out, messy, confused, vulnerable, I think it does resonate with the, uh, with the reader. And it's, it's interesting how, you know, we might have uh, like a primary identity that, you know, we latch on to, but in reality, we're all composed of many different identities. Okay. Um, which could make something like a, um, a wedding like a traumatic experience <laughs> in, a, in a way. It, weddings are, are, are very great, but then like I'm thinking of my wedding and I'm thinking of like all the different people from mm -hmm. different parts of my life. <laughs> and it was trauma, it, was, like, it, it made me anxious for weeks because I was like, all these people are gonna be meeting. These people are like, <laughs> my, <laughs> my family's gonna be meeting with my tag football friends. <laughs> like, it's like, and so like, but then when you're a, ch a child of immigrants, like it just, that sense of multiple identities just heightens and the anxiety. And when Namrata was speaking, I was like, I feel, I feel you. Like, it's like a, a question as simple as, where are you from? Oof. 
could be right. so, like, <laughs> depending on, you have to answer it different ways depending on the place and depending on the person. Mm. So if I'm in a cab in New York City and the driver is West African and he says, where are you from? And I say, Boston. Oh. That's an insult. Yeah. That's an insult. Like, the correct answer is, I am Sierra Leonean. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm from Sierra Leone. If that same person asks, where are you from? And you say, my parents were born in Sierra Leone, but I was born here. That's the wrong answer. Mm. You are Sierra Leonean, you know? Um, if I'm in New York City and someone um, asks, uh, where am I from? then the correct answer is Boston. <laughs> if I'm in Connecticut right here, you know, because I'm here just for a short stay, I interpret that question as where are you coming from? Yeah. And that is the Bronx. <laughs> and so it's just, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. You have, a, you have multiple identities. Um, you know, the quote, Brian, that you said, like how people see you and how you see yourself. Like if you're a child of immigrants, um, the way the, the, the world sees you at best is you're one thing. Mm -hmm. At worst, you're neither. Like, you go to Americans and you're like, I'm American, I'm born here. And they're like, where are your parents from? Where are you, where are you, where are you from? And then you go to, to your, your African family and then you grow up with all these toys on the floor and the ability to talk back to them. <laughs> and they're, <laughs> they're like, you're American, you're American. Um, <laughs> And so, but in your heart, you feel full, um, fully both. Yeah. Um, and so when I was writing fiction, I was like, you know what? I want to capture many voices. And, you know, people can make of it what they, what they make of it. I would say that, like, <laughs> as an yeah. immigrant mm -hmm. or having these straddling connections, yeah. like, thinking about in home, you don't have a question of identity. You are what your parents say you are. And that's it. Like, there is no exploration. There is no, like, and if you act against the cultural agreements of that in your home, you are othered in your own home. <laughs> you know, mostly disciplined, but in, in that way. So it is rough. Well, my brain's all over the place because I'm an academic and that's what it does. Um, I know we were going to move to audience questions. I want to, before we move to that, just thank you because I honestly could sit around and listen to all of you for hours because this, this question and whoever put this panel together is at the core of life, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yes. <laughs> and I was, I mean, my home is a very blended, mixed home, and I keep thinking about, like, that's my sacred space and, and bringing good energy into that space. But then when the boys started dating and some of the bad energy that came in with that dating space, and I was like, not in my house. You go, <laughs> go out in the garage. Take that argument out in the garage. Um, but I was also thinking, all of us, in the world right now are really thinking about homes, the history of homes and how awful we can be to other people and their homes. Um, and, I, and I had a question for the panel to just discuss before we take audience questions about why is it important to write about home or at least to explore home and why is it important to write towards who you are as a human being. Um, and if this was an audience of K-12 students, I'd be like, listen here, take notes. You know, what is your answer to that? Like, why home, why identity, why, why? I'll just start and say, I think um, it's a universal experience, right? If you're unhoused, your, your definition of home is different than if you're housed in Westport versus Norwalk versus Bridgeport. But there is something from, as we evolved from cave people to now, home is what anchors us. And it is, it is the universality. And all of the individual stories thematically have to be grounded somewhere. And a setting is home, right? Regardless of whether it's a train or whatnot. So I would say that's the relationship. I, I think of, um, I, I like what Sadiq was talking about, you know, the, the different countries. I know for one thing, for myself, when I, um, when I hear a Jamaican person voice, I light up. Yeah. <laughs> Could be in a crowd someplace, or in an environment, out someplace, and you hear a person speak in Jamaican. I, I think her, I'm like, yeah, and it's just it's just something comforting about that. Um, but 
you know what? I've been practicing just letting go of things, not using the word my. So not, it's not my apartment. It's the place I live and, 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 and things like that. So I, I figured that I could share whatever I had. And so I had my granddaughter come and stay with me. And, you know, she had visited and she was like, you know, Mumsy, your place is so peaceful. <laughs> yeah. And um, she came to stay with me for a little bit. And, and then it got chaotic. And, and I was like, do you remember you said it was peaceful here? And, um, but what I came to see was that I, I was overcompensating because I had unresolved issues, some, some energy that I needed to release of some, um, some behaviors that I did when I was a child that I was holding on to. And so then I kept repeating the same behavior, trying to comfort her, try to comfort my daughter. And um, because of something that was missing within myself that needed to be comforted, so I kept trying to do it on the outside. And, and, and when that happens, what I realized is I was showing them that they were better than me. You know, you're better than me. Here, you have this. As a matter of fact, my grandmother's big bed that I never got to sleep on, my granddaughter, I gave her my bed, my room, and everything. And then she started treating me like a second-class citizen. And then I started using the word my. This is my home. This is my room. This is my bed. You know, get out. <laughs> you, you can't have this anymore. It, it became chaos in the house. But I had to take back the space because, you know, I work and I work hard. Like, I work 144 hours in two weeks, um, two weeks ago. It's a nice paycheck. Um, you know, but I was like, when I, but when I come back to this apartment, I want to be able to go into this room and rest and, and lay my head down and, and feel that, that peace in, in the environment. So that's what that physical um, space mean. And I had to, um, you know, completely embrace that human experience, you know, to live fully in it. Um, but, but, but so, you know, so then that, that became important, even though I was practicing not using the word my, my, you, you know, you could share, but, but then that becomes important in, in that way. Yeah. Other thoughts? I, th I think, um, yeah, like you had mentioned, I think I write about maybe things that have gone awry and amiss in the home a lot, um, because I think there's sort of, there can be, I think especially, you know, in the US, we sort of inherit this thing from the 50s of like this idealization of what home is and the nuclear family. And I think that makes folks territorial sometimes or really li liable to see like the home is a castle, everything out there is dangerous. So I like to, yeah, to write about home, but also what it's like to leave and the things that aren't perfect about inside, inside home and the idea of home. Um, yeah, I think, I think um, you know, whoever said that, like, uh, the only way out is in, or, um, you know, I kind of think about that with home, you know, y you write what's in your heart and then by just leaving yourself vulnerable and out on the page, you reach, you reach other people. You know, I was here last night. Um, I heard uh, Neil Gaiman, and I, I keep forgetting that Neil Gaiman's British, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, he's just Neil Gaiman to me. And so, like, uh, so um, I'm here, and I had a moment. I was sitting, I was sitting in, the, in the back right there, um, nice, cozy seat listening to a Neil Gaiman story, and I'm like, I traveled from the Bronx, I'm in Connecticut, we're all listening to a British author, and we're laughing at the same thing. Mm. And it was just like a, it was a, a small moment, but I was like, that just kind of speaks to the, the universality of, of it all. That and I was, I said when they sat me in this spot, because this is where Neil Gaiman sat last night, for those of you who weren't here. <laughs> but our bodies embody the same space as such brilliance. And so I hope we can continue bringing that kind of brilliance forward in our own, in our own work. Um, do we have questions from the audience? Please? This panel has been so perfectly wrapped up <laughs> that you have hit all, everything for us. <laughs> so I'm going to remind the audience to <laughs> applaud our authors one more time. <laughs> and for those of you who are here, we do have copies of everyone's books in the Kamansky room for you to purchase, including Mr. Gaiman's books. <laughs> so if you pick up a book and bring it over to the signing table, which is right over there, 
um, these wonderful people will sign the books for you. Also check out all of our partners that are seated on this side of the room and have a great day. We're gonna start the next panel in just a few moments.